test. Good evening, everyone. It certainly is a joy to see everybody uh, fellowshipping and, and speaking with each other and so on, but it's time we get started, okay? Um, again, uh, if we have any visitors here, thank you for being here. Uh, please, please come back. And uh, the rest of us, let's just encourage each other by coming as often as much as we can to be with one another. Y'all don't normally see me with glasses, but I can't read that without glasses. Okay. All right. Good. I th again, it's just a, just a joy to be here. Our first song will be number 537. 537, we will sing all three verses. Here we are but straying pilgrims. Here our path is often dim. But to cheer us on our journey, still we sing this wayside hymn. Yonder over the rolling river, where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our feet are oft unweary on the hills that throng our way. Here our tempest darkly gathers, but our hearts within us say, song with the same opening in the songbook number 538 we'll sing all four verses of my hope is built on nothing less my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus name on Christ the solid Rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his cover, not his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my 
hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, fault less to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. We'll now have our opening prayer. Help me. Our loving Father, I want to come to you now and thank you for this beautiful day. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. Thank you, Father, for your love and for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Father, for the salvation that we have, the gift that we have through, through your Son, Jesus. Father, we thank you for providing us with your word and for the, the chance that we have together here tonight to learn more about what, what your will is for us. Father, we thank you for our leaders. We thank you for uh, Larry and Luke. And, and uh, pray that you watch over Larry and Pam tonight and, and Larry's brother. Help him to recover. Father, we pray for all those who are hurting, all those who are sick in our congregation. Again, God, we thank you so much for your son. We thank you for his willingness to die for us. That we have forgiveness of sins through him. And that we could be made whole and, and made righteous in your eyes, that we can have hope of eternity one day with you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. The Lord's Supper has been left prepared for those that were unable to take of it uh, earlier today. Uh, we will serve that after we sing all three verses, number 383, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my wrath your soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring it seems before me. Help me walk from day to day with this shadow o'er me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my rapture soul shall find rest beyond the river. We'll now uh, take, take this as an opportunity for those who were unable to take the communion this morning. When we come by, if you'll raise your hand, uh, and we'll serve you. Please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. You have given us your Son, the greatest gift that could ever be given, that we could be called your children, 
and take on his name and become part of his body so that when you look on us in eternity, you see Jesus. We thank you. Help us to take this bread which represents that body, the body of your son, which we have become a part of. And do so in a manner that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Our dear Holy Father, we thank you so much for all the many things that you've given us. The greatest is your Son, Father. And as we prepare to take this memorial to him, we pray that you'll be with those that take of this cup, which is your Son's blood. Pray, Father, that we'll examine our lives. Forgive us when we fail you, for us Christ's name. Amen. For those, for those that wish to contribute to the work of the church, there's been a basket. There's a basket left to the back for that purpose. Before our scripture reading and lesson, we're going to sing number 431, both verses of number 431. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless thou the song if you want to mark it after the lesson will be number 915 trust and obey
Good evening. If y'all will get your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. I'll start reading in verse 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the pro of the prophets. Thank you. Good evening. I'll be filling in for Larry tonight. Please remember him and his family in your prayers. I know that it's got to be a real difficult time. He's had a lot of um, heartache and, and death in his family recently, so we need to remember him and uh, pray for his brother and his health. I don't have an update for you, but um, just really remember him and his family and Pam as they're traveling to, I know, back and forth some. Um, we're not going to, I'm not 100% sure. I've been teaching a class, and I had been pretty good about watching Larry's lessons on Sunday night to try to kind of keep up with what y'all are talking about. I've been teaching a class over there with some of the young families and adults, but I'm kind of behind, so I, I told him I'm going to talk about something completely different. So if, if you're planning on wherever area y'all were going, going before, I'm sorry, we're going to kind of be out of that, that sink, and he'll come back and pick that up. He hopes this next week, we hope that everything goes well with his brother and his family. So a couple of weeks ago, we had kind of an elders, ministers retreat. We do it every once a year um, to kind of get together, look at the year, look at what we've done, look at where we're going. Um, we sometimes have special things we talk about. And one of the things that I was asked to do this last time was lead us in a little devotional thought. And as I began to think on what, you know, you know really try to highlight what are we going to do, how we're going to be, and I wanted to try to do, you know, do a devotional that would inspire us as, as elders and ministers to... Um, Really, this next year, how can we seek and save the lost better? And how can we build up a better congregation? How can we strengthen our core here? How can we grow? And I began to kind of search the scriptures to see how we're supposed to do that and what it does. And what I learned was, and I think this is something that I know, but we have a difficulty sometimes in our language, is when it came to the way I was speaking and thinking about what I could do to accomplish this or what we could do as elders or what we could do as this, we sometimes lose and have a mistake and how we talk, and sometimes even how we think, and I think it drives how we even act. So oftentimes we say, we need to be a church that goes and seeks and saves the lost, right? That's the language that we use. Well, how are you going to save somebody? What are you going to do in order to forgive somebody of their sins? We can't, right? Only Jesus, only through God and through Jesus, can one be saved? There's nothing I can do. If I was to die on, your, on the cross, I'm sorry, I'm an imperfect man. It wouldn't do anything for your sins, and it wouldn't do anything for you. But because of Christ and who he, he was and how he lived and what he did, he alone can save us. But oftentimes we get into this language or this thought or this process of what can I do to save someone? Honest truth is I can't do anything. You can't do anything. Jesus alone can be the one who can save it. I, I watch, I don't know if you watch much TV. I don't watch many commercials anymore. Luckily, we can skip them when I watch, you know. But I did catch one the other day, and I've seen it in a little a couple of different variations where there's some sort of tragedy or something going on, somebody choking, somebody having a problem. And it's like, is there a doctor in the house? And somebody stands up, oh, I'll take care of it. Give me a straw. Give me alcohol. Give me this. I've got this. I need a knife. And somebody says, are you a doctor? And he says, no. But I've watched a lot of ER. I think I've got this. You know, and he kind of steps in to take that role. You've seen these commercials, at least I have. And the truth of the matter is, they're not the person, right? They may have seen it a lot, I may have been around it a lot, but I am not the person. And the truth comes to that when it comes to the scripture as well, because we think, what can I do to save anybody? Well, I can't save anybody. 
Even though I may spend a lot of time knowing, reading, searching, growing in my relationship with Christ, I am not Christ. You are not Christ. Baker Heights is not Christ. Now, hopefully, we're living in such a way that his presence is living in us and they can see Christ through us, that his presence is here, the Holy Spirit living within us. But I am not the vehicle that saves. I think we miss that sometimes. We lose that sometimes. We think about these things. So instead of thinking about what we can do, we have to think in different terms on how we can introduce them better to Jesus. And how can I show Jesus better? How can I teach Jesus better? And when I began to think about growing and and, and strengthening a congregation, and I think a lot of times we do this and we struggle with this, at least I do too, is we put a lot on to our ministers because we think if we have the right preacher, the right song leader, the right elder, the right deacon, that all of a sudden the church is going to grow and the church is going to be strong and the church is going to be what it should be. And we put off this attitude that all we need to do is have the right guy to do it for us. Because we get kind of in this mentality that if we want a strong congregation, one that, that is growing, one that's doing these things, we need the right person to do it for us. This is one of the traps we fall into when it comes to ministry, and I learned it very early on, and it was something that's been very difficult to manage. I think all ministers have this problem. I remember when we first tried out over here, I didn't tell Carrie's going to tell the story, hopefully she didn't care, but <laughs> we, I, when I first came to Baker Heights, I was working at Greenlawn, we, we, um, we're at LTC, and the youth deacons who were there, we just happened to be at LTC at the same time, and they said, they saw me there chasing, you know, 80, 90 kids, and they, they said, hey, would you be interested in, in applying for the job here at Baker Heights? And I was hesitant because, one, I grew up here. This is, uh, you know, I, I sat right over there. I, I remember rolling underneath the pews. We threw airplanes when the thing fell. If those of you have been here long enough, there used to be this platform that came out over the speaker. When it fell, some of the airplanes that went off of it they were mine. <laughs> I hope I didn't cause it. But I can, you know, I grew up here. My dad had been an elder here a couple of years before I went off to college and started working, or a few years before that. And so it was real hesitant to say, you know, it's real difficult to come home or to do that. And I told him, I said, I'll apply, but don't hire me unless you really think I'm the person for the job. And we need to really make that really clear. I don't want any sort of like, oh, you're, you know, we're doing this or doing that. I said, if, if, you know, I apply, if you look at what I believe when it comes to youth ministry, when it comes to these things, that I could be used here at Baker Heights, that's great. But I wanted them to be very, very sure. If there was even somebody close, you probably ought to go that direction because of some of the, the problems that could come with that. Now, this was a long time ago. Many of y'all are just like, oh, you grew up here? You didn't, you know, you may not have known, but yes, I did. Anyways, I remember right after we got the job and got hired, one of the parents came up to my wife and said, Put, her, put his arm around him, I won't mention the name, and he said, so y'all are the guys that are going to get my kid into heaven, <laughs> and my wife looked at her, looked at him, doesn't hold her tongue too well sometimes, and said, oh, you're one of those parents, <laughs> because we do that sometimes when it comes to our ministers, we will put off our responsibility onto them, it happens with youth ministry all the time, I'm a, I'm a youth minister that sometimes hates youth ministers, Because what ends up doing with parents is parents stop teaching their children because, hey, I have them now involved in a youth program. I don't have to do it anymore. Hey, look, we have this really young, energetic guy. Well, I'm not young anymore, but a really young, energetic guy to do these. He's going to take care of us for it. And I, as a parent, you know, he's in good hands. I don't have to, or my son and daughter, they're in good hands. I don't have to worry about that anymore. And they stop doing it because they think a minister should do it for us. Now, we do the same thing when it comes to our song leaders and our preachers as well. How many times do we get frustrated because the preacher didn't visit so-and-so or didn't go to the hospital or here or didn't do these other things? We hired this preacher. They should be doing these things for us. They should be taking care of the things that we need and that we do, and we have these expectations on our preacher that they're going to fulfill what we're supposed to do. Or we want our preacher to, you know, inspire and encourage and get us in those things which is all part of what they do and part of what they're involved in, but it's not their job to do the things for us. We miss this sometimes. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. Oh, sorry, not chapter 6, chapter 4. When it's talking about the idea of spiritual gifts, and it's talking about how Christ, as he ascended you know, up into heaven, he left these people in charge to do certain things and give them spiritual gifts so that they may continue to grow and strengthen the church 
But listen to the wording that's said here. It's in chapter 4. I'm going to start reading in chapter 9, um, verse 9, chapter 4, verse 9. It says, now this he ascended, and what does that mean? But that he also first descended into the lower um, parts of the earth. He who descended also was the one who ascended far above all the heavens, as he, is, has, as he might fill all things. And he himself gave some, gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we are to come in unity of the faith and the, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfection man, to a measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should go no longer, that we should no longer be children tossed back and forth, carried about with every wind or doctrine, but by the trickery of men and cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things to him who is the head, Christ, for whom the whole body joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies according to the effective work by which every part does its share, causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So there's some key things that I think we miss sometimes. We look a lot at this verse about spiritual gifts and how God gave some to be this and God gave some to be that, but I don't think we always continue to read and understand because why did he give these people these gifts? What was the point? It tells us right here, for the equipping of the saints for the work, uh, for the equipping of the saints of, of the work and of some of the pastor, uh, and of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the job of the people who are put here to be apostles, to be ministers, to be teachers, to take these roles as prophets and do these things, their job was to equip the saints so that they could be working and doing and growing. Not so that they could do those on behalf or for the saints, so that they may help equip the saints so that they may grow and they may work and they may continue to be that unified person that we're called to be in Christ. Their job was to equip the saints so that they may work. But oftentimes we view this the other way and we look at our ministers and I want you to do this for me. And I want you to take care of this for me. Instead of looking at our ministers as people who should be equipping me so that I can do something. We want them to search the scriptures so that they may give me some insight or some light. Instead of looking at our ministers to, so that they may help us learn how to search the scriptures and grow. Instead of looking at our ministers, our song leaders, I want somebody who sings really good so that I feel inspired by their, their voice and by their things. Instead of looking for somebody who helps me as a congregation, inspires me just to sing better. They don't have to be perfect. They have to encourage me. They have to equip me. That's what we want people to do, right? That's what our ministers should be doing. But how often do we look around at our ministers and saying, why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? Why is this not happening? Why, is, why, are, you know, why are these needs? Instead of looking at ourselves saying, why am I not doing these things? Why am I not reaching out? Why am I not evangelizing? Why am I not growing? Why am I not doing the things that I read in the scripture that it's called for me to do? So when I was asked to kind of lead this lesson, I, I went a, a certain direction with it, and I kind of want to share that with you all tonight because I think it applies with this mind and this concept. When I started thinking about what we can do or how we can save, I began to get overwhelmed with the thought that there's nothing I can do to save anybody. I started getting out overwhelmed with the thought that the fact that really I don't need to be doing something for somebody. I need to be equipping them so that they can do what they're supposed to do. If we want to be the kind of congregation that's growing, we all need to be moving into the direction of Christ so we're not tossed back and forth, so that we're not little children, so that we're maturing in the faith. And that comes from doing stuff. That comes from growing. That comes from action. That comes from dedicating ourselves to certain things. So I think one of the best ways to look at that is to go back and look at the first century church and look at what the example is laid before us. What did they do? And this is where I saw that verse that struck me so strongly that and we'll read it here. If you want to turn, it's where we're going to spend the remainder of our time. It's in Acts chapter 2. We're going to be in, uh, we're going to start in, in, in 38 and go on down to the end of the chapter. But it was, this struck me as you read the story, and if you don't know it, this is on the day of Pentecost. This is the very start of the church that, that, that's going on here. 
Jesus has ascended. He told his disciples that they're going to go out, they're going to preach the word, and they're waiting for that Holy Spirit to come upon them. And here on the day of Pentecost, it's going to come upon them. They're going to go out. And why some of the same people, if you kind of know the way it works, some of the same people who would have been in the crowd that crucified Jesus, when you arrived for the day of the Passover, you didn't just travel for a day and then go home. You stayed for weeks and months at a time. A lot of them would have came for the Passover and stayed through what we call the Feast of Weeks, and into the day of Pentecost, because this was a celebratory time in which they would have different feasts and festivals throughout from the day of Passover all the way to this day of Pentecost. And they, the apostles are sitting and waiting, and all of a sudden the, that whirlwind and the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they're talking to some of the same crowd that was there when Jesus was crucified. And they began to preach, and it's where we have this miracle of the tongues of fire, and, and you have them being able to, to, to speak, and people were hearing them in their own native tongue, because people would have come all over, people and Jews that lived around the world would have come back for this special time. And they heard this miracle, and some people was like, oh, they're drunk, and some people was like, no. Uh, this is the, and, and they all were hearing in them in their own tongue, and this miraculous thing, and we have part of Peter's speech here, or Peter's speech that he gives to him, and he begins to teach and talk to him about the Messiah, the one that was going to come. And the Jews, if you were a Jew, you would have heard these stories. You would have heard and understood and known who the Messiah was. And it would have, especially at this time of year, when you just, you know, finished the Passover and you're talking about the Feast of Weeks and the first fruits and everything that came, this all led up to this idea of Messiah. And they understood that. The Passover, they would wait and say, where's Elijah? They were waiting for him to return. This was something that would have been heightened at this time. And he says, you know, all these feasts and festivals, the one we've been waiting for, that guy, he was here, and you killed him. I mean, that's summing up in a, in a very short passage what he's going to preach to him. He says, this person that, that all these things have been around and the one we've been waiting for, and it says the people were cut to their heart because they, they knew. You know, I've always struggled to, to, to explain or, or get the kids to realize that it wasn't a long time span between when the crowd was was welcoming Jesus as the Messiah, you know, this king throwing down palms and cloaks and welcoming him in, till some of these same people are going to be yelling, crucify. And it's amazing when kids start to realize, he said, these are the same people? I said, yeah, they're some of the same people. I said, what happened? What changed? See, they thought and understood, a lot of the crowd understood Jesus to be the Messiah, but they had all these earthly thoughts and these earthly things that Jesus was going to be this earthly king, that he was going to raise up this army and defeat the Romans and, and create this big earthly kingdom. But what he had was so much bigger and stored. So when they saw him under what they appeared or what looked like to them under Roman rule and Roman you know, beating and telling them and said, all of a sudden their hearts began to change and look and they said, this isn't the Messiah. This guy lied to us. This guy wasn't telling us the truth. I just sang his praises. I said he was the Messiah. And look, now he is beaten, he is defeated, and I thought this was going to be the guy. And so some of their hearts began to change, and some of them began to get angry. And I think some of the same ones that probably shouted out, you know, Hosanna and welcome Jesus were some of the same ones that said crucify. Because all they could see before them was this earthly thing, and they had no idea what he was really doing. They had no understanding of those things, even though he told them. And so when they heard this story, it says the people were cut to the heart, and that's where we read in verse 38, if you'll follow along with me, of Acts chapter 2, it says, then Peter said to him, it says the people were cut to the heart, and they said, what should we do? We just killed our Messiah. And then the Peter said to him, and said, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you, to your children, and to all that are far off, as many that the Lord God will call. And then we have this wonderful picture after this that says that, that the number that are going to be added, and, and we have these, these people who respond to this gospel call. It says now that, this, now that they're getting this bigger picture and this vision, they said, what do we do now? It says now repent and be baptized, put on a spirit, live as though you're living for Christ, be this, this, this different person. And then we're given this neat piece of passage here, which describes what the church did. This is in verse 40. It says, And with many other words they testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from the per this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day there were 3,000 souls who were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine 
and fellowship, and the breaking of bread and prayer. Then, far, then fear came upon every soul, all is probably a better word there, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all believed and were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as many had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and the breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness, simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we've given this example about what the people did right after they were baptized, right after they understood who Jesus was, what it was, they had this bigger picture. It said that they did, they dedicated themselves. This one said that they they um, this is the New King James I have here. It, the word that was used in the New King James was that they uh, continued steadfastly. I think that word dedication is probably something we, we understand a little bit more, that they gave energy and effort. Maybe even the word discipline would, would fall into this. This was not just something they just happened to do. They gave energy and effort into it. So many times when we, when we have a task or we have a job or we have a hobby, there's those of us who just kind of do it, and maybe we have some natural ability and good at it. It's this idea that you're actually going to work at something, that you're actually going to put some energy into it. We oftentimes don't think about church that way. We want something we get out of or something that, that's given to us. But this way, it's talking about that people actually worked and gave something. They dedicated themselves. They disciplined themselves. And it said they did it to four things here. It said that they, they did it to the, uh, the apostles' doctrine, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and in prayer. So when I began to think about these and the things they dedicated themselves to, and I looked into what they were and what they meant, I heard echoing the response of what uh, Eric read to us when Jesus was asked, what's the most important command? What should we be doing? And he re what he's going to recite to him is what's called the Shema. It's found in Deuteronomy. It's the, it was very sacred to um, the Israelites. It's still sacred to them today. If you're an uh, a, um, Orthodox Jew, you might even have a little box or you have it written in your... your your wrist and your forehead because of what it's talked about there in Deuteronomy as these words should be written, that the Lord our God is one, that Shema means to hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and you should love them with all of your heart, soul, and might or strength, is what it says in Deuteronomy. Now, as we read it a little different in the New Testament, but that's partly because they're, they're now in a real Greek-centered kind of Hellenistic society in which when you said the word heart, it was different than what we kind of view today. This is my understanding as much as I read. The reason we kind of have that broken into mind and heart as two separate is because with Israel, what you felt and what you know was one thing. You couldn't believe or feel something and it'd be different than the reality or the knowledge. They were kind of connected. We kind of have that problem today a little bit that we may feel something and something else be true, right? And well, in their mindset, it was all in one. So when you said heart, the heart didn't come just from emotion. The heart was also involved with the mind. And so you kind of have that broken apart or differently here. That's the best kind of interpretation or thing that I've kind of understood for that to be why it has now four instead of three. But those four things he says is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength or might, this idea that it has together. So we're, we're supposed to love God with our mind. The things that we think, the things that we do, what we put our energy and thoughts into, we're supposed to love them with our heart, how we feel, our emotions. We're supposed to love him with the things that we do, and this idea of soul is who we really are, this, our, our, our very essence. And so if you can kind of look at it in those terms, and so when I began to read what they dedicated themselves to, I couldn't help but hear some of these things being played out. When it says they dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching, that sounds a whole lot like mine to me, what I think, what I know, the knowledge I have. When it says it dedicated themselves to the fellowship, if you understand this idea of fellowship, it wasn't just, we think of fellowship, sometimes we get this idea of potluck or this idea of spending some time together, and yeah, that's a part of it, but it's the things that we do together, this quantania, this sharing, this brothership, how do we interact, how do we, we share our faith and things together in this sense of the things that we do, I couldn't help but think, isn't that our might, the things that we do, we do with one another, our strength? When it says that they shared the breaking of bread, most of them think that in this context, it's probably talking about that Lord's Supper. 
And if you start reading about the Lord's Supper and what it is and the understanding of it, it's something that to me is to the very core of what we are as Christians. We meet together on the first day of the week because we see the example that, of that set in Acts as the groups came together, met on the first day of the week, took communion together, they broke the bread together, they took of this meal because it reminded them of who they are and who they belong to, the very soul of what they were supposed to be, the very soul of who they are. So that when they dedicated themselves to the communion, I can't help that that speaks to that element of soul, of our very identity in Christ. As we partake of that bread, of that cup, I'm part of the body. I'm part of his body and what that means. And then when I thought about the idea of prayer, I can't help but feel like prayer is the language of our hearts, how we feel. When you pray, aren't you expressing either the thanks or the wants or the needs? Aren't you expressing what's coming out of your heart when you pray? I, I hope you are. I hope it's, it's sincere and it's coming from those directions because to me that has so much to do with how we love God with our heart on how we pray and what we care and what we do when it comes to those things. And so I think I can't help but feel like there's an expression that's, having, that's happening here when, these, the, when it says that the church dedicated themselves, these group of believers, that's what the word church means, gathering group of believers that are here together, dedicated themselves to these four things. And then notice what happened as they did. We continue to read. It says, Then a great awe came upon every one of the souls, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now all those who were believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and their goods. They divided them among all who had need. And so they continued daily with one accord in the temple the breaking of bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So what did the church do to grow? What did the church do to strengthen? What they did was they did what they were called to do. They loved God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. It was expressed in this way as they studied the scriptures, as they spent time together in prayer and communion, and as we see those things, notice that, that it's out of these things that they, all of a sudden these wonderful signs are being done. All of a sudden that, that people are starting to, as they spent time together in fellowship, as they spent time together knowing better what Christ wanted them in their lives, that I think it was spurred that, that community that you see that we want so badly in which they're sharing and encouraging and helping one another, spurred out of their dedication. It, stirred, it spurred out of their steadfastness. As they continued to grow, guess what happened? The church continued to grow. It continued to strengthen. And so that upon that, who was adding to the number that was being saved? The Lord. So when I came and started thinking about all this, so often we want to, I know I kind of reversed this with my joke at the beginning or the, or the thing, but we so often want to say that it, you know, it's somebody else's job, the professional or somebody else or the minister or something else. But when we read it throughout scripture, it says that we are supposed to be the ones doing the good works. And as we do that, we grow closer to Christ and it strengthens his body into the perfect person we were called to be. That's what it says in Ephesians. You want to quit being tossed back and forth from every doctrine and everything? It's not because a minister or an elder or somebody else is going to do it for you, it's because I'm going to do it. I'm going to grow. Their job is to help me, to equip me, to help give me those opportunities, to encourage me, to, 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 to spur me on. And that's also my job is to equip and spur other people on as well. We read that in scripture. As we grow and as we mature, we take on those leadership roles and we're supposed to be spurring and equipping others. It's supposed to be something that grows so that we're always reaching out and reaching up and growing together as we're trying to get closer to Christ. And as we do so, we become the thing we so desperately want to be. But it comes from me dedicating myself to the teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So often we want some magical answer or something like that, or if we only hired the right minister or appointed the right elder or, or changed the right thing to our building or, or did the right program. That doesn't mean we can't, you know, inspire or do those things. It doesn't mean we're not worried about those things. 
but those things spur from us doing what we're supposed to be doing anyways, by growing steadfastly, by dedicating ourselves, and that's where our focus needs to be. And as we do those things, that other stuff spills out of us growing, dedicating ourselves, and helping one another as we do that. Too often times we end up in that mindset, and I know I do too. And as ministers, we end up in sometimes the, the very reverse of that, where I'm going to do that for you. I can't. I cannot save somebody. We get in that mindset sometimes, well, if I just do the right lesson or if I just say the right thing, I might be able to introduce them better to Jesus, but I will never be the one doing the saving. Christ alone can do that. We don't add anybody to the list. God does. And we, we forget that sometimes. We look at our ministers, we look at our elders, we look at our leaders, and we say, hmm, well, what do we read here? The church dedicated themselves. They took responsibility. They took discipline. And they grew from there. We do come together so that we can encourage and spur and hopefully equip one another. I don't know where you're at in your journey. You may not yet put on Christ in baptism. You may not have taken that response yet to say, hey, I've messed up. I need to repent. I need to grow. That same cut to the heartness that we read there for the people Many of us have put our faith in the wrong things and have not yet put our faith in Christ. Or you may be somebody who, you know what? I need some encouragement. I need some equipping. We gather together, and one of the things we always like to do when we gather together is give that option of an invitation, just so that if you do have one of, the, one of those needs, if you find yourself and you look at, you know what? I struggle when it comes to the action, to the doing, to the, to the fellowship. Or I struggle when it comes to the heart. Or I struggle when it comes to the mind. Or I struggle when it comes to identifying in Christ. You know, I, I feel like I don't always give my all in those things. That's when we encourage. We spur one another. I love the description we have in Philippians that as we push and desire to take hold of Christ, he takes hold of us. It's not a one-way street. We're all growing. That's what it's described there in Ephesians. It's not like all of a sudden you're mature. It's something we continue to do. And the way Paul says it, it says, not that I'll fully obtain this until Christ obtains it in heaven with me. But we all spur on. So if you have any need at all, please come as we stand and sing. He sheds on our way while we do his good will. He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear can abide while we Trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust
trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Good evening, church. Glad that you're all here. Glad that you chose to, to join us tonight and uh, worship our Lord with us. Uh, Luke, we appreciate that lesson. I have a few announcements and a couple of cards here. There's a table in the foyer for Jessica and Brian Burton for a gift card shower for the birth of the new baby. You can talk to Jessica, Shelley, goodnight, or Carrie Bauer if you have any Questions about that? Let's see Brian's back there. Congratulations. Hope mom and the baby are doing well. So, um, November 20th, Eastern European Missions will be here on Sunday. Mark your calendars for that. Um, November 24th, we're having a Thanksgiving Day meal here at the church. If you would like to participate, please sign up for that and let uh, Miss Goodnight know what you can bring, if, if you can bring anything. But uh, please sign up so they'll know how many people will be here. There's a sign up in the back for our Wednesday night fellowship meal, which is going to be a turkey dinner. That's for November 16th. And please sign up for that. Also, uh, and if you can bring a dessert, there's a sign-up sheet for that as well. December 4th is the final day to get the forms in for the Christmas holiday baskets. If you know someone who could benefit from that, please sign, sign them up. And December 3rd at 4 o'clock, the Kids Bake Off. There's a sign-up sheet for that as well. And... Uh, Redeeming the Tears, third annual memorial, will be Saturday, November 12th, 10 a.m. here at the building. Uh, we'd like for everybody to come and participate in that. And as we remember those who who passed within the last year of our congregation or, or members of our family. I have a couple of cards here. I'd like to read those, and then we'll, we'll have a closing prayer followed by a, a closing song. Leo Holloway has asked for prayers for his wife, Avenel. Uh, just says health issues, so we want to lift her up. And Charlotte Longley um, asking prayers for, for their son, Chad Longley, currently in the ER, having problems with his esophagus. We'll have a procedure to fix the problem tomorrow. So if you'll bow with me, we'll, we'll lift these up to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day, this opportunity that we've had to come here and fellowship with one another, fellowship with you, and, and worship you, Lord. Lord, we want to lift up Avenel Holloway. Don't know what the, the health issues may be. But Lord, we know that you are. We know, are aware of those, and, and we know that you are able to, to take care of that issue. Pray that you'll be with her and, and Leo and Please help them at this time. Lord, I also want to lift up Chad Longley and, and pray that you'll be with him and be with those who are performing the procedure on him tomorrow, that it will be successful and that it will correct the, the issue there. Lord, we also want to lift up John Sullivan, Larry's brother. Pray that you will help him recover from the heart attack. Please be with Larry and Pam as they travel back from Oklahoma City. Lord, there's many others in the congregation who are ill. We want to lift up those as well. Um, Michael Coffey, Gina Madeley, Manuel Eastman, and Cassie Weed. And Lord, I know there are many others that I did not mention, and you're aware of that, and pray that uh, you will be with those. Lord, just pray that you'll be with this country um, as we have an election coming up this Tuesday, Lord. Pray that you'll be with 
everyone that uh, they will cast their vote, that uh, we will elect leaders, Lord, who will follow your will. Pray that you'll just be with this country. Lord, we thank you so much for your son, his willingness to come to this earth, live as a mortal man and, and die and take on our sins. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. As we go into the new week, we'll have struggles, we'll have joys, but this song reminds us of who's in charge. Number 991. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world, he shines in He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. We're dismissed.